David's latest book is called Finding Meaning, The Sixth Stage of Grief. It's currently available in stores and online. What, what got you interested in dying? When I was 13 years old, I had a mother who was dying in the ICU in a very sterile environment. I wasn't allowed to be in there because you had to be 14. And at the same time across the street in the hotel was one of the first mass shootings in the U.S. So at 13 years old, I experienced my mother's death and this traumatic mass shooting, and there was no one there to help me. And I knew there should be. So in some ways, I think I've taken that, and that's been a lot of my meaning, to help other people go through some of the worst moments in their life. Is there a name for the specialty that you do? Some people call it thanatology, which is the study of death and dying. Others just call it death and grief specialists. So a lot of people come to this work from different areas. It's the one thing in the human species that will happen to all of us, right. and we don't know when. And we're also a society that doesn't know how to do it anymore. I often think I'm teaching people what our great-grandparents knew how to do. We're a productive society. We want to get over it and move on. That isn't how grief works. We have to learn to live with it. Does that mean our great-grandparents handled grief, grief better? I think in some ways they did because they knew it was part of life. Americans almost think that death is optional. <laughs> like maybe we'll do it, maybe we won't. All right, the sixth stage. Now the five stages are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. What's the sixth? The sixth stage, I believe, is meaning. And when my own son David died, I thought, I can't stop at acceptance. I need to find meaning. That was the book, for me to find meaning and help other people. How old was David? 21 years old. What did he die of? He died of an accidental overdose. Mm. He had been in recovery, doing well, in sobriety, and had one of those arguments that any 21-year-old has with a girlfriend and was dating a wonderful social worker and went out with some friends and used again, and the drugs are so deadly these days. And you had already written about this? You had already been concerned about death when your son died? I had been a grief specialist for years. And even though I had been a grief specialist, nothing prepares you, of course. I wanted to write a letter to every parent I'd ever counseled, saying I had no idea how bad the pain was. But I did want to find a way to honor him. And I talked to so many story people in this book, got their stories about their spouses, their parents dying, their siblings dying, their children, even pets. You know, I always think that grief is about love. And if there's love, there will be grief someday. All right. Is death different if it's your 21-year-old son or your 70-year-old mother? Yes, it is different. However, it doesn't mean that one is better or worse. I always say grief is a no-judgment zone. You know, when some people, people will ask me, which is worse, you know, this death or that death? I always say the worst loss is yours, the one you're dealing with at this moment. For one person, it may be their 100-year-old parent. For another person, it may be their child. Someone else, it could be their house burning down or their job. How will this book help me? Well, what I hope it will help people know is that in grief, there is pain, of course, but there's not just pain, there's also love. Finding meaning doesn't take away our pain, but it gives us a cushion in addition to it. And what's really important for people to know is the meaning is not in the death. The meaning is what we get out of knowing them out of honoring their life, out of remembering them. So the first five still count? The first five stages, people absolutely go through them, but we always say they're not linear, they're not a map for grief. You don't have to do them in any order. But we go through anger, we go 
into a period of denial. I can't believe they're gone. Will I grieve differently if uh, my loved one died in an auto accident or if my loved one died of natural causes, older age? Absolutely. One, we get a little prepared for. We know someday when our parents get older, they'll die. We're not prepared for a sudden death. So sudden deaths are often harder to deal with. You know, one moment someone was here, and the next moment they're gone. You deal with your own personal grief. You write about it in your book. Has your personal experience helped you understand it? Good question. Yes, it helped me to understand it, but it didn't take the pain away. People would say, you know, what's it like for the grief specialist to lose his son. And I say the grief specialist didn't lose his son. The father had to bury a child. So it helps, and yet I also know I have to grieve long and hard like everyone else does. But what, there was a long period of time when people didn't talk about death, right? They didn't. It's, it's really surprising. I had the privilege of working with people, for instance, Michael Landon, who was public about it, went on The Tonight Show to talk about cancer openly. Before him, that didn't happen. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross brought death out of the darkness. Tell our audience who she was. Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was really a hospice pioneer and a legend in this area. She was. She identified them in her book on death and dying that has its 50th anniversary right now. 50 years since that book came out. So there's a new edition. And I'll tell you, Elizabeth was a very organic, rule-breaking, pioneering person. And somehow the stages that we got to adopt for grief have been turned into five easy steps. And she would be appalled by that. We often think of that last chapter as the throwaway chapter. And she said, no, that's an important chapter. So her work has brought about modern-day hospice, palliative care, lots of important things. It's changed the way we see end of life. Why, why is hospice helpful? Hospice is helpful because we've gotten this misunderstanding that what helps at the end of life is technology. And we look for miracles, and there is a time in our life when we have to realize if there's a miracle to be had, God doesn't need machinery to do it. God doesn't need medical technology. And there is a time to not be in the hallway when your loved one's dying in the hospital room. There's a time to be at their bedside, holding their hand, saying goodbye. And hospice and palliative care knows how to do that. We're all afraid of it, aren't we? We are, and it's fast. It's we don't know what, it, what happens. We don't know what's next. And here's what's fascinating. Americans want three things in their death. They want their death to be pain-free, sudden, and in their sleep. Correct. But here's the reality. When we went back and talked to people who were dying of cancer and said, if you could go back to the day of diagnosis and die that day quickly, pain-free, suddenly in your sleep, would you have wanted to? Almost all said no. When we're healthy, we say, take us out of the game quick. But at the end of life, the wind down becomes important. Do people who are dying, do they grieve for their own death? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, you know, they have a lot of goodbyes. They have to say goodbye to their world, their family and friends. The dying person actually has more goodbyes than we do. You wrote a book that was praised by Mother Teresa, right, called The Needs of Nine. The De Needs of the Dying, my what, first book. What are the needs? The needs are tender, loving care, open communication, to die a pain-free death, to die surrounded by your loved ones, to make sure that your wishes are followed by the health care workers who attend you. They're simple things we all deserve at the end of life. I mean, I have, like, literally Mother Teresa and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross to thank for my career. I remember I had a lot of grief when President Kennedy was killed. Right. Someone I didn't know. And we don't think public grief is real. 
and yet public grief is. Because that person, a President Kennedy, uh, whoever it was, a celebrity, they helped us know ourselves. They were part of our history too. So when they die, we are connected with them, even though maybe we never met them. Why are we so afraid of it? I think it's the great unknown. I also think we don't talk about it anymore. You know, when I was a kid, we would be driving somewhere and we'd be stuck behind a hearse. When was the last time you were behind a hearse? It doesn't happen anymore. We move the dead around our cities now in white unmarked vans. Americans don't have an experience of death and dying. Death moved into the hospital and we lost that experience. The problem is it's so freaking final. Death is, but I also think when someone dies, we don't stop loving them and they don't stop loving us. And we are going to miss them forever physically. Do people who believe in an afterlife, religious people, do they die better? I think for some it's a cushion. For some, it's not. I, I, I don't think there's any right or wrong way to do it. I, I do think that I personally believe there's an afterlife. I think we're going to see each other again. It may not be like this, but I think we'll connect again. So I believe with everyone I've seen over all the years that we do go somewhere. I don't think energy disappears. What do you, what do you think about assisted death? Uh, quite a few states now have approved it. Do you approve it? It's a complicated issue for me. The reality is I believe everyone gets to make their own choice. My job is to make sure in hospice and palliative care, we give you such a peaceful death and a peaceful way to leave this planet that maybe you want it or maybe you don't, but that's certainly your, anyone's right to have it. Whose life is it anyway? Right, right. it's the person who's dying. And a lot of times when we say that person's dying wrong, I always say, just remember, each of us have our own death just for us when our time comes to do it our way. Never miss a beat. Subscribe to Larry King now and watch new episodes every day.